sequel to another script, a thing called Love at Second Sight uh, mm-hmm. to Lorimar, and then Warner Brothers took it over. But, and you know, that just turned out to be a disaster, being made basically at the same time. In fact, they finished that first, and my parents had come to visit, and we went to see the finished version of that movie. And my dad, it was like middle of the day, and my dad afterwards said to me, you, you've got to find something else to do for a living, you know? This episode is brought to you by Bulletproof Script Coverage, where screenwriters go to get their scripts read by top Hollywood professionals. Learn more at CoverMyScreenplay.com. I'd like to welcome to the show Tom Schulman. How are you doing, Tom? I'm very good, Alex. Nice to meet you. A pleasure to meet you as well, my friend. I have I mean, first of all, I want to say thank you for uh, being such an instrumental part of my youth growing up uh, in the 90s. <laughs> I, I, I'm not hope that you, I hope I hope you like the results, but uh, <laughs> yeah. no, I mean, from I mean, you know, obviously did Poet Society, but what about Bob, Honey, I Shrunk the Kids? Uh, so many great films from that from what it's what about Bob is one of my favorite oh, insanities. Well, <laughs> <laughs> I wish it, I always, always, anytime I talk about Hollywood and, and the way it used to be. I always use What About Bob as an, as an example. I'm like, they wouldn't make that movie today. Studios wouldn't make a What About Bob, but my God, isn't it an amazing thing that th- at least it existed at that point, but I wish they would make these kind of smaller films. They used to make the 10 or 15 films and yeah. one, two or three tent poles and like kind of throw them all out and one or two would take care of everybody. But now it's just like- no. They they don't have that love of movies anymore, you know, as, as executives, they're just, it's all bottom line. It's all IP. It's all superheroes. But, yeah. you know, like I think that Spielberg said it best. I think just like the Western, it, it will play itself out the superhero genre eventually. It's hard. It's been around for a long time, but I think he's right. I mean, sir, I would never I mean, the, argue with Steven Spielberg about that. Well, <laughs> well, obviously you can't because if yeah. not, uh, you know, there's yeah. there's things that happen. Lightning comes down. It's crazy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Our but, screens uh, both go black. Yeah, yeah our, our screens go <laughs> black. Accounts just drain of money. Like, what happened? Like, <laughs> right, exactly. You know, it's just suddenly, uh oh, you know. But uh, <laughs> exactly. But, That's yeah. it. See, that was that was Stephen right there that did I, that. I, I didn't touch my screen. Yeah, my, my, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, Tom, so, let, so my first question to you is: How and why, in God's green earth, did you get into this insanity that is the film industry? <laughs> Boy, that's a good question. You know, uh, I grew up in the South. I grew up in Nashville. And, um, you know, I later found out that that the South was kind of a dumping ground for uh, horror movies, AIP, American International Pictures, and yeah. all those companies. Those movies didn't perform outside of the South. But so I grew up, you know, every Saturday going downtown with my friends on a bus and what, going to two or three really lousy horror films, you know, and, and, uh, uh, and it really, I, I liked movies, but, you know, that was just kind of a, a, a junk form of entertainment. But then mm-hmm. in college, they they had a film society and they started bringing really interesting movies in, you know, things from Kurosawa and Fellini and Bergman and, you know, just stuff that I, I had no idea movies could do. And I just was fascinated by that. And uh, senior year in college, I had a chance to... Um, either write a term paper about uh, one of the novels we were reading or um, make a short film. So of course, everybody in the class made a short film. I made a little super eight film and it's terrible, but just fell in love with the process and thought, this is what I want to do. Well, the thing, the thing that's interesting is that when you were coming up, it wasn't a cool thing to be a director. It wasn't even in the zeitgeist. It wasn't a thing that it was even possible honestly there was very few people doing it you know compared to today where you know i remember growing up and the only behind the scenes i saw was a star wars documentary and the raiders of the lost ark uh documentary that was and whatever books i could find at the library there was no other information about the filmmaking process that's right so that you that you jumped in and like you know i think i'm gonna give this a go is amazing crazy crazy (laughs) in hindsight so stupid but you know (laughs) Well, that's isn't it? Isn't it amazing though the 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 delusion of of the filmmaker and the screenwriter is it's his his or hers best friend and worst enemy, yeah, at the same time because you need delusion to do what we do. You do. It's so true. But at a certain point, 
the delusion becomes a handicap when you're like, well, I'm the greatest or yeah. I'm going to see you at the Oscars or Steven Spielberg is going to produce my next film. This right. insanity <laughs> starts to come. No, in. The megalomania comes with it, you know, for sure. You know, the same little power you have in the in your world of creating it on the script, a page or, you know, if you're directing on the set, suddenly you're just, you know, uh, I have a friend, I have a, a director, and he says after he gets through shooting a movie, he finds himself running it, people running into him on the streets of New York. And it's because on the set, when you walk from the monitor to the to the actor, everybody moves out of the way. But, you know, after the movie, nobody's moving. You know, they don't know who you uh, are. So, you mean yeah. like you mean I have to get my own coffee? Like, yeah, exactly. I don't... <laughs> right. <laughs> What are we savages? Yeah, uh, friend says he just loves to put his hand out, and a diet coke comes in. You know, just it's it, without it, it is a it is a strange, strange carny kind of lifestyle, isn't it? it, it you know, I always say I always say we're carny folk. Uh, you know, we're carnival folk because it's you. We ran away with the circus essentially to do what yeah. we do as as, a, yeah. as filmmakers, as a screenwriters at any level, whether it be Oscar winner or just be working filmmakers uh it's it's the circus it really it really really is it really is yeah yeah and yeah you just hope you don't end up in the you know <laughs> with the within the deformed area of the you know <laughs> where, yes where are the freaks where are the freaks and yeah. uh let's just yeah. say we don't want to end up in a Guillermo del toro carnival <laughs> that's for sure yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah. or any so, of the carnivals in those horror movies i saw as a kid you know they oh just, good lord yeah. Sorry. So you make so you make the decision to like, OK, I'm going to go to go go be a writer. And as insane as that is, I'm assuming it didn't just you wrote your first script and all of a sudden every, the door swung open. The money just started tossing at you. All the opportunities. Were in it. I'm assuming there was a, a, a time period where you were trying to hone the craft, getting slapped around by the town. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, so how long was that? How long was that window? Uh, that window was about, I mean, it, it, I mean, I, I guess 10 years. I mean, right. in the sense, I mean, I, I started getting work um, enough, basically after about four, four and a half years, I started getting enough work to not have to, I mean, I still kept my day job, but I, I you know, didn't, Smart. Cause I, I, you never know, you just, you're working from one, one, you know, uh, to another, but it, it was, I was thinking, wow, I'm saving some money. This is, I seem to be getting steady work. Nothing's getting made, but I'm getting paid to write. So, okay, you know, sell, optioning some scripts, selling a script or two. And then, so that was about four, four and a half years. And then another five years of, you know, a couple of TV things getting made for television, but they bore no resemblance to what I'd written, you know, that kind of thing. So you just- you mean you, the, So you mean the Gladiator wasn't your original vision, sir? <laughs> I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, no. So uh, it's, uh, yeah, yeah, I've heard I've heard stories of and for for the youngins listening, there was these things called TV movies of the week That's back right. in the eighties and early nineties, which which was a, a really fertile ground for a lot of filmmakers because that was where they 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 got the foot in to show people what I mean. Spielberg got dual yeah, the TV dual movie of the was, week. Still, it's a great movie. And yeah, and it's, yeah. It's amazing. So during that time, um, what did you do to keep going? Because there was no indication, at least, that you were going to be able to make a go of this. It's it's really hard because, you know, you're just, there is no bottom rung of the ladder where you go, oh, I'm on. And now I can, I'm, I'm, I'm on my way. You know, you're just, you're always jumping for it until you're suddenly... You know, as they say, you can't make a living in this business. You can only make a killing. And that's kind of true. There's just no in between, particularly back in the old studio days. You know, there were yeah. indies getting made. And, you know, I think I think my world opened up a little bit when John Carpenter made Halloween again, because I was writing, you know, low budget horror films at first. That was my, you know, what I'd grown up with. And and uh, so people were suddenly and maybe even before that were buying you know, indies were made were horror films. So. Yeah, I mean, yeah. When the the um, oh god, um, Easy Rider was a kind of thing, and yeah, yeah, yeah. But that was the seventies and eighties. But yeah, I mean, I think it was when John actually did. That was the first really, truly, like full blown indie. That, yeah, out of yeah. nowhere, it didn't have Jack Nicholson and Peter Fonda in it. Like it was. Right. Yeah. No. That, and, but uh, it was still. But it was still. It was still not. 
it was still not what it it wasn't in the 90s the 90s is when the independent movement yeah. as we know it really exploded yeah so how do you go from the gladiator tv movie of the week to dead poet society how did you write like how did you come up with it how did you get it out there it's it doesn't seem i know like in today's world you put out dead poet society it's going to be a, it's going to be a tough sell because of it's a drama and this and that and blah, 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 yeah, blah. Yeah. in those times late 80s early 90s they were still making films like that so i guess it was a little bit more open to that but that's still not a slam dunk by any stretch of the imagination not at all i mean you know, interesting because i think it just tells about the times dead poets opened with the first batman with with that's uh, right yeah right. With, yeah, so, yeah and you know little do we know at that point and batman did really well but little did we know that that was going to be the trend that started to you know uh, take Hollywood away. And, and, uh, but yeah, no, it was, it was a very hard, I mean, I, at first, I I can't really remember why I decided to write it. I'd been, I'd, I'd been being paid to work, you know, not getting movies made. And I think a lot of the stuff I was writing were just things I thought would sell and, you know, you they sort that. of yeah. did, but I don't think I was that good at that stuff, you know? And um, and then just I, I had been telling this story about this this the, the basic dead poet story to a girlfriend for a while. And she was going, God, that sounds so good. You got to write that. She and I broke up. I got married. My wife saying the same thing. And I finally just said, OK, I've got a couple of months here. I'm going to just sit down, clear the room out and do it. And I did, you know, and and uh, uh, my agent at the time read it called me up at two o'clock in the morning saying, this is the best script I've ever read. Let's talk in the morning. I'm okay. Great. And awesome. uh, I went into his office that day and he said, you know, I've been thinking about this. I, I, it's a great script, but I, I will not be able to sell it. And uh, you know, if you want to get this made, if you want it to be any more than a writing sample, I, I hate to say you're going to have to get another agent. And I said, well, I, I, you know, I understand all the deficits of this script, but yeah. So I left and I, you know, I think took five agents before I got another agent to to say yes. And that agent said, I've only read half of it, but there's some clients here at our in our company that, you know, actors that I think might be good for it, some young people. And I remember thinking, boy, what if he ever reads the second half and drops the, the project, you know? Yeah. But that, a, was, that, yeah. that ending was a bit, uh, you know, it was an interesting ending to say the least. Yeah. yeah. So, um and then uh, Stephen Haft, who who had read the script just maybe a month after I got that that new agent, and a year and a half later called him back and said, you know, I just can't get that script out of my mind. Let me, I want to option it. I think I've got some 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 uh, connections that might be interesting. Little did he know, every studio had passed. I mean, it was just you know as dead as dead could be. Right. Yeah. I mean, I did the people at Disney and it was touchstone at Disney that eventually bought it. You know, I, they did. We I did get a meeting there and they said, you know, it's a strong story. But poetry, you know, dead poet society, the three, you know, all, any one of those words in a title is 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 death. But this is all on the same one. And they said, why don't you make it about, you know, make him a, a dance teacher? You know, oh right because of course what had just come out but dirty yeah. dancing yeah yeah so <laughs> like nah, no i don't think so right that's amazing and, yeah and then out of nowhere uh you know maybe th three years after i wrote it uh stephen half gave it to jeff katzenberg who read it and bought it immediately and you know we had a meeting two days later and he said we're making this movie let's let's cast it and go so my god so it was yeah. so it was jeff katzenberg who got it and it, yeah yeah. And, and took off with it, and yeah. then then Robin and P Peter Weir. I know. I mean, I know. It's like, funny. I had seen Witness the day I finished the script. My wife and I went it. out to, to Witness, and I just said, "God, if I could get him, you know." And she said, "Well, send him the script." So when I polished it up and so forth, I did, and of course they passed. And that was was that. I didn't, you know, so that you know, a couple of years later to get him was amazing. That's a, that's a, that's so interesting for for a, a, a script. Uh, of a film that was so well received, obviously, uh, and a script that eventually won the Oscar. I love hearing these stories that it was not this that the town knows nothing. William Goldman said is that the town knows nothing. It takes one person with a just a slight bit of vision, just a and a little bit yeah. of cojones, yeah, to roll the dice and and That's obviously right. some power and some power. Yeah, 
I mean, it's it's a me too situation. You know, somebody always told me you can learn everything you need to know about executives by watching two, three year olds on the in, in a sandbox. You know, if there's an object that's like a, an old bucket that's sitting in the corner is if nobody will it'll sit there for weeks. But as soon as one kid gets it, they all start fighting over it. Right. And at that age, kids can't their necks won't go like this. So the answer to everything is no. So, you know, that's those that's the executive uh, mindset. It's easier that's to brilliant. say no. Yeah, that's yeah. a that's actually a brilliant. And I've never heard that <laughs> before. That's actually brilliant and very very true. It now is. You, yeah. you get you, you know you get Robin Williams who at that point Robin was Robin. I mean he was still Robin Williams. He wasn't yeah. Oscar winning Robin Williams. That was a few years away, but he was still Robin Williams. Yeah. Um. And by the way, that title Dead Poet Society only title worse than that Shawshank Redemption. Uh, <laughs> only title <laughs> yeah. worse yeah. than Shawshank yeah. Redemption. Yeah, but when and Robin we stunk, you know. So what? Do you and, that, and that movie, yeah. who, who, who's even yeah. heard of that movie? Right, exactly. <laughs> so when you when you, what is it like working with Robin and Peter? Were you on the set? Did you know how would that whole? Pro- I mean, you must be again coming from TV movies of the week to that was the first big one, right? That was the first. Oh time. yeah, yeah, yeah. I I had sold strangely enough on the same day that 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 Katzenberg bought Dead Poets. I sold another script, a thing called Love at Second Sight. Uh, to Lorimar and then Warner Brothers took it over. But, and, you know, that just turned out to be a disaster being made basically at the same time. In fact, they finished that first and my parents had come to visit and we went to see the finished version of that movie. And my dad, it was like middle of the day and my dad afterwards said to me, you, you've got to find something else to do for a living, you know? And then- uh, oh, that's, then we, oh, that's rough. <laughs> I know, I know. But then we went over to Disney and looked at, I, I got them to screen a few uh, dailies for my parents of Dead Poets. And they said, they said well, maybe you got a chance after all. We'll see. But uh, yeah, it was, it was, uh, you know, it was, I don't know. I, I kind of, I, all I was concerned about at the time was that they're going to make what I wrote, you know? So it was, I, I wasn't playing defense by any means, but, but, you know, I, I was in there sort of, fighting for my, you know, for, and didn't really have to, because those, you know, we all had the same basic vision of the movie. So it was, it was amazing. And Peter Weir, I mean, it's funny because his first question to me was, why aren't you direct, why didn't, why aren't you directing this? I can sort of feel from the way you write it, that that that's what you want. And I said, Peter, <laughs> first of all, no one's given me that. <laughs> if I were directing it, I would just step aside for you, number one, but two, you know, are you crazy? Nobody, this thing is barely getting made, you know? And he goes, yeah, I understand that. And then he said, well, you know, I, I would like you on the set. And, you know, if wow. if, if it gets boring, you know, if that's I, I'll understand. But, you know, since you want to direct, he said, I've made eight movies. You know, I'm happy to sort of help any way I can. I mean, he was so generous, you know, so. So um, you shadowed Peter Weir, essentially. The whole time. Yeah. And we just had, you know, he would always say to me, just feel free to. I mean, the first day he said, just anything you're thinking, feel free to just talk to me about it after a take, you know, and after about two takes, as soon as it was over, I'd walk up to him and go, but what if a minute? And he said to me, you know what, just count to 10 before you talk and then, then say it to me. And I, I said, you know what, I'll just go home. And he said, no, don't get offended. Just, just please give me a chance to have my own thoughts and then you can talk, you know? So I said, okay. So I did that. And maybe on the third or fourth take of the first shot, he said, well, why don't you go direct the, the shot, the scene? I said, Peter, I, I'm sorry, I'm talking to him. I said, no, no, I mean, it. you have an idea, go. So I walked out on and Rob, I see Robin look over at Peter and Peter nods, it's okay. So I give Robin something to do and come back and he does it. And Peter said, what do you think? And I said, it didn't work. And he said, I don't think it works either, but nice try. And okay, we'll, we'll try that again some other time. And he was wow. amazing, absolutely amazing. And I said, well, what if I screw this up? He goes, I'll fix it. <laughs> you know? such so, a con- was- such so much confidence in oh yeah, in yeah. Under- comfortable he's so comfortable in his own skin at that point that he doesn't even have an ego not even threatened by you in any way shape not or form all. he not was just all. so generous to you that's wonderful yeah he was he was fabulous so what so okay so i have to ask because i've had multiple people on the show who've worked with robin um and what is it like seeing robin on the set you know it, i'm assuming he riffed he had to have written. Oh yeah. Well, interestingly enough, 
the first he he shot i think we shot for three days and then he had to go off and and he was in a play on broad i think he was well uh waiting for godot on broadway with steve martin so he was kind of going back and forth but the the play was two weeks away from the end of its run so we got him for three days and then he came back and we had him for the rest of the shoot and you know the first three days he was so on book so perfectly on that that there was it was a little bit dead and I was saying to Peter, this is, I'm worried. And he said, I, I am too, but don't worry. And I said, well, what are we going to do? He said, well, you got two weeks to figure it out. So when he got back, it was kind of like that. The first take again, we were in the classroom for the first time. And he said, uh, Peter said, all right, I got an idea. Let's do an improv. He said, Robin, if you were just teaching these kids, what would you teach them? And he goes, oh, I might read to them. Might teach them a little Shakespeare. And Peter said, we're going to roll cameras, just come in and do it. And Robin immediately came in and, and, he saw that teach, you know, he had no script. So he started connecting with the students in the way he's so good at as a stand up, but also as an actor. And he realized right away, oh, this is a dialogue, even if the, t the, the students aren't saying anything. So he, you know, that improv stayed in the movie. We've got that. We had that. And then, you know, from that point on, he completely got it, felt absolutely free to do whatever he wanted. And it was great. And 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 imagining that young cast who turned out to be a couple of heavy hitters came out of that cast. Yeah, that's right. Uh, they must have been, you know, like um, I'm improving with Robin Williams. Yeah, was. I know. No, they they were up to it though. You know, they were they he was they were so, young. such a kind guy, so nice oh, to everybody. So it was just never any sense that you couldn't you you know he just he was so encouraging why not you know you just pretty soon you relaxed and you just said whatever you wanted and that's what they did so what was the biggest lesson you learned from peter watching him on that set as a director or as a storyteller in general um say as little as possible to the actors unless you have to you know really give them a chance to do what they what they've brung to the to the party and then intervene if they're off you know but don't over direct. Don't walk up and go, okay, you know, this is the moment where da, 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 and this is what just happened and all that. See what they bring because 99 or 89 percent of the time their their instincts will be right. And if you tell them, oh, the other thing was always answer a question with a question. And they'd say, well, what, what's happening here? And he'd go, well, what do you think? And then they would, you know, he knew we'd talk through all this stuff, but that allowed them to own it. You know, they'd say, well, I think this, and that, that puts it into the actor's body. So very simple, deceptively simple, you know, but, but very effective. Now, the one thing I, and, and for everyone listening, this is going to be a spoiler alert. So if you have not, it's not our fault. It's like what, 32 years old, 33 years old at this point, this movie, mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not our fault. If you haven't watched it, if you want to skip this part, we're going to talk about a spoiler alert here. The ending of that film, I can't imagine it ever getting made today. Just mm -hmm. ever. How did you, uh, how, the balls of Katzenberg and Weir and yourself to put this out there in that way? Because that is such a touchy subject. Suicide is such a touchy, I mean, yeah. obviously it's a minefield uh, to touch in, but it's perfect for that film. It is, yeah. it's necessary for that it film. Is you can't. Necessary. You can't yeah. move that. You can't end that film without it. Um, at least being satisfied, uh, That's you right. know. That's right. How did how did you guys approach that? How did Peter approach it? How did Robin approach it? How uh, how did you approach it? Like, because it's such a touchy thing. And at what point did you say in the writing process, "I'm I'm gonna this is what's gonna have to happen in this film." Well, when I wrote it, I was too naive, I think, to think that it was anything difficult, you know, it just it was part of the story. It's where the story had to go. And that was that, you know, and when Peter and I met and started talking through things, you know, at one point, I don't know, we kind of avoided the suicide for a while. But finally, we got to and I brought it up because I said, Peter, you know, frankly, now after I see people's reactions and talk to people, I'm, I'm worried about this. He said, you know, I had the chance to meet Ing Ingmar Bergman once, and Bergman told me that the only thing you could do that would absolutely destroy a film was kill, have the main character kill himself. <laughs> and so I said, oh, my God. And I, I said, what are we going to do? And he said, we're going to hope Bergman's wrong. <laughs> and I said, OK. And so th that was kind of it with him. And we never had debates at the studio about it. It was really. Yeah. It's because because Katzenberg's a filmmaker. 
He, he, yeah, he really he just, was. A... He, I, I mean, I, I think I'm sure they thought about it, but they never said anything to me about it because I think they saw that you couldn't have this. It just wouldn't be a good story without it. Story wouldn't work. Certainly the ending of the movie, the very ending of the movie wouldn't work without it. And and uh, but and, there, you know, anything short of that would have just to be kind of wimp out, I think. You know, right. Exactly. Story. But the soul, you know, the soul, the soul of the script would have been gone. Yeah. They, you know, they wanted to change the title of the movie. That well, that, yeah. That, to be fair, yeah. <laughs> to be fair, let's exactly. let's they call tried. it what it is. They yeah. What would it, what, what were some other names? Did you do you remember? Well, they, yeah, they they asked the marketing department and the distribution people to all eat. They made each of them come up with twenty alternative titles to the story. So we had like this thick, you know, piece of paper, double on both sides with just hundreds of names. And they picked Keating's Way. And on, uh, oh, uh, I know. So oh. on the, uh, for the first few days of the shoot on the slate at the studio's insistence was Keating's Way. And Peter was a little bit worried about it. I remember we went to a video store and Peter loved to, whenever somebody would recognize him and say, what are you doing next? He'd say, do you really want to know? And they would go, yeah. And then he would pitch them the whole story of the movie. Take them, he and because he loved to tell the story, that was the way his way of, you know, really getting into it. And I remember one guy said, Robin Williams. And that was not a comedy, is it? And it kind of chilled Peter a little bit because he realized people are going to come expecting Robin to be in a comedy, which this wasn't. But it just sounded. So he said, I'm a little bit worried about the title. But after about three or four days of seeing that on the slate at the he called he called me and said, I'm I'm we're going with Dead Poet Society to hell with Keating's way. I've told the studio that's the title and just that's it. And I said, well, what are they going to do? He said, well, they're going to take it or they're going to fire me. So I said, okay. So wow. <laughs> that was, that. yeah. Geez, yeah. That's so, the Keating's way for God's sake. I know. I know that that was a TV movie title, right? I mean, that, that was a TV movie, but Robin, yeah. was that Robin's first um, dramatic, like deeply uh, dramatic role? Bizarrely, he had made a movie about two years before for PBS in black and white called Seize the Day. No. About, yeah. About it. And when I heard that, I, I mean, not having anything, knowing that Robin would ever even be, you know, a possibility for the movie. I went, oh, my God, somebody's made a movie called Seize the Day. It's, I bet it's exactly like this. But I, I you know, it's always my paranoia. And uh because, you know, you sort of assume that once an idea hits you, it's hitting 40 other people at the same time. Mm -hmm. That guy kind of works that way. But anyway, it was not that. It was a very dark, very grim film about an Robin plays an insurance agent who does anything but sees the day. He just lives a very small life. And um, so that was a very dramatic role and kind of but, you know, wa walking dead. I hate to say it. And uh, I mean, maybe I should see it again. But but um, no, he had done. I guess uh, Garp. He had done, everything. yeah, World Corner of the Garp and stuff. But it's still, but none of those are hits, and and it was still pre Goodwill Hunting. So, yeah. you know, he had this was the first time they showed his chops. Uh, but by the way, before we walk, before we did this interview, I, w I went back to watch that trailer just to, just to kind of like remind me of I haven't seen the movie in a while. And they the first sixty seconds, it's it's set up almost as a comedy. Yeah, like it's set up as a comedy. And like when I'm watching it, I'm like. My God, they're setting this up as a. I mean, they kind of get oh, a little no. bit more serious at the end, but it, it's really a, an uplifting trailer. <laughs> I know, I know. Well, you know, then the marketing department does what it does, right? They just exactly. So, all right. So the movie comes out. It's it's a hit. It's definitely a hit in the in the video stores for sure because I was working at the video stores when that came out in the 1990s in high school. So I remember recommending that film constantly to people and the people coming back, like you did tell me about the ending, uh, but it was beautiful. <laughs> so you, so you right. go and it gets nominated, you win an Oscar and now you're kind of, you know, you've basically, you've, you've hit the dream for all screenwriters pretty much. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You've won an Oscar. How does the town treat you? How do you deal with it? Cause I've heard I've had other Oscar winners on the show. It, 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 it varies on yeah. how the accolades, how the town treats you, you know, all of that stuff. How did you, how did you handle it? And what was it like? It was, it's, you know, I mean, I, I had, by the time the Oscars came around, I had already had two fairly, you know, hit movies in the theaters. 
Honey, I Shrunk the Kids and Dead Poets both came out within a couple of weeks of each other. Right. They both did, did really good business. So, you know, I was getting oh, lots were... of offers and stuff. That just put it up to another level. And then it, it it's it's hard because people start saying, you know, I don't, I'm not going to give you notes. And you kind of go, what does that mean? I just don't, I, I would never want to tell an Oscar winner, you know, what, how, what to write. And you kind of go, you know what? I'm no better now than I was when I wrote this. And, you know, I need input. I need feedback. I don't, I need your honest feedback or, you know, I, I that's just, you, you thrive on that. It's sure. not always, it's not always pleasant, but that's, that's what you do. So um, it, it, it was hard that way. And, you know, also just to be deluged with so many offers, literally, if I had been diligent about it, which more, more diligent about it, which I should have been, I would have been reading, you know, a script or two a night for, a couple of years because they wanted just, you to direct not just write, not, it, write direct write and direct but you know i act, put it out whatever I, whatever you want to do what you know really it's it's crazy and and um so i don't know that i handled it well because i still really wanted to i had my own ideas of things i wanted to do so i i, I kind of kept putting those offers aside in a way and you know looking back i turned out some really good things and it was you know just go some wow. big shows some big shows yeah, that would big, yeah. big hits and uh, you know to their credit a lot of times you know i would read the book that was offered and i did not see what the movie that they made in that book you know so some very excellent people got a hold of it with a better grander vision than mine but still it was it was hard and it just you know you kind of go from from you know your own Same. your own house you know getting the mail and taking care of your family to this thing where you you know you could literally eat lunch and dinner on somebody else for five years honestly it just never stops people want to take you out wanted to end. it's and, it's 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 the golden ticket in many ways but yeah. just like lottery winners uh some people deal with it differently some yeah. people it destroys them Right. Some people don't take advantage of the situation when it's presented to themselves. And and it's look, it's you you have there's no book on it. Um, there are some more interviews like this out there where I ask these kind of questions of Oscar winners. I'm like, dude, how did you deal with this? Right. Um, right. you know, but it's it's a it's a small club, the Oscar winning Yeah, writers. Yeah, it is. And I, I mean, for me it was the the luck of it was is that the the you know, five or ten years of of working, you know, basically in in my basement, you know, alone doing it prepared me because I I had done, written a lot, so you know I felt I, I was never confident, but I felt pretty good that I could you know, about delivering what you know that I that I if some, if I got a job and and liked a project that I could, I could give them something that you know at least they wouldn't hate me. Did you did you after you won the Oscar? Because I've always fascinated about this. Do you still were insecure as a writer oh yeah you know and but the expectations go up right now right. you're an oscar winner they expect everything you turn in has got to be genius because you're you know, an so oscar winner yeah at least i felt that but you know it, it it didn't take long to shake that you know you can you just i mean mainly fortunately for me the day after the oscars i had to get up on a plane and go and have some meetings with bill murray over what about bob so it was just immediately back to work you know what about bob was kind of you know that was a that was a that was a that was a pretty big hit as well if i remember yeah yeah it yeah, wasn't that, you know, i i can't remember but yeah no it was it did well and uh but it but i had that work to do so it was i didn't have you didn't time. get a chance to overthink things you were just yeah you were, not really you were working yeah. and so with with honey i shrunk the kids uh again did you did you were you brought in on that was that an original idea or, or you you were brought no, in i was brought in i mean uh i would say 10 days before the anticipated start of production before the first day of production they fired the entire group they fired the writers they fired the director they fired the producers <laughs> I, I think i'd heard that rick moranis had balked that it was he had been sold that it was comedy and it wasn't a comedy and my agent called me and said, you're starting this rewrite um, tomorrow and you've got, you know, eight days to to turn it to, to turn it into a comedy. And I'm like, I, I, what are you talking about? So he sent it to me. I said, I, I, I no, I, I can't even get through this. It's a drama. What are you talking about? I've already committed 
you're doing it. You know, you're, there's a meeting tomorrow at eight o'clock, be there. You know, I'm like, oh my God. So that was like a Wednesday. And I went to the studio and I said, you know what? I, I, I got to think about this. I don't, I don't, I, I can't just start writing. I got to have a, a take on it. They said, no, 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 no. You don't understand. A week from Saturday, this is going in a pouch to Rick Moranis. He's reading it on Sunday. If he's doing it, he's going to be in Mexico on Tuesday, starting the shoot. If he reads it and doesn't like it, we're scuttling it. I'm like, oh, my God. And they said, so start tomorrow. I said, no, I'm going to start on Monday. I'm going to think about it for three or four days. And they just, every two hours, Katzenberg would call me and go, you ready to start? Come on, start. Just start writing. Just put some words down. That's all you got to do. Just, and I'm like, no. I'm, you know, so. I, I remember when that movie came out again, this is, this is prime video store time uh, during when that movie came out. Uh -huh, and, uh -huh. Oh my God. That was such, that was a monster hit. If I remember it, it was. was, it did a lot of business theatrically. It destroyed in the video store, spawned a sequel, spawned a, sh a ride or a show at Disney world. Yeah, a ride and a, and a series too, you know? Yeah, yeah. that's yeah. right. Yeah, uh, no, it was, uh, but you know, it was the idea of the previous team. That was, you know, all credit. I mean, it's genius. That. It's yeah, it's a fairly yeah, genius yeah. idea. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So that, that part is, you know, but, but yeah, it was, and it was a surprise hit. I mean, it actually was released along with Batman against Batman. I remember that. Actually, I remember that weekend. I was like, what's this honey? I shrunk the kids genius, but the concept is fairly genius, especially for the time period that it came out in. Yeah. It, yeah. it, it, it just was perfect, perfect for that time. But I mean, and you look, you go back and you look at that movie. You're like, ah, you know, the visual effects just weren't ready yet. <laughs> That's I know. I know. I know. At the time they, they at the time they worked, but you know, I mean, I can, I can remember, you know, because I always saw those Flash Gordon Saturday morning Flash yeah. <laughs> things they made in the 30s. And you kind of wonder, will Star Wars ever look like that? And it kind of mm -hmm. did after a while, you know, a little until, bit. Until he, yeah. until he polished it up a bit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, but when you first see it, it's so amazing. You just it, it feels like that is as real as it's ever going to get. And it's perfect. So well, it, uh, it, it yeah. didn't bother the box office. Let's just put it that way. No. When it, and when it, it came but, out. But, yeah. The sort of fake grass and weeds and honey didn't either. But and the it, big it, the ant head and yeah, 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 yeah. So it was like it reminded me of that um that movie in the fifties. Was it them? Is it called them right. the ant the yeah. giant ant movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. The the uh, I think that what had happened was is that the previous team had told Disney they wanted to do all the special effects kind of analog, old style, that the bee would be a man in a bee suit, the if you oh, know, Jesus. that kind of thing. So Good Disney Lord. had them shoot a test. They saw it and they just said, goodbye. That's it. We're not doing it that way. We're getting other people. So they got Joe Johnston, who was a model yeah. maker at, yeah. at ILM. And, you know, that's – that's. Uh, they called Joe. I remember. I, I, I think I saw that in the ILM documentary or something on Disney+. Plus. He was like, yeah, and then they called me for this Honey, I Shrunk the Kids movie, and they just needed someone who could do some effects. So I got right. the job. Right, right, right. And right. it was George. Yeah. It was George Lucas who – who gave him the attaboy, like the Donnie Brasco, he's, 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 he could do it. Yeah. I think Jeffrey called George and said, who you got? And George said, I got this, you know, he's a model maker, but he's, he's brilliant and he can do it. And Jeff said, okay. <laughs> you know, so uh, those things don't happen today. Like, unless it's, unless it's a Steven or, or someone from the old guard making those calls. But I think once that generation is gone, these the new gen there's just nobody that has that kind of juice anymore or has that power to even do that no one at disney other than maybe Iger, uh right. could, could well, do that eisner, eisner was part of that i mean well, I eisner too of course the first i i had made it because i'd gotten sick every time i went to mexico i made it because they said well, you know you're going to be on the set and i said nope not going to mexico to be on the set of this movie that i'll i'll watch dailies here not going to cry no so they said, you know, at that point, they I had them because we were deep into into a seven day, you know, process. But um, the first day the dailies came back, I was there, and and something happened. And Jeffrey looked at me and said, "Did you write that?" Little kid said something. He said, "Did you write that line?" I don't remember that in the script. And I said, "No, but I like it." And he, they stopped the, the dailies, and they said, uh, "Get Joe Johnston on the on the on the phone." So they got him on the phone. I remember David Hoberman, who was head of production, was talking to him and he was saying, you know, we're not going to improvise. We've worked really hard on this script. We 
And then he hung up. And Eisner said, what happened? And he said, he hung up on me. And I was like, "Uh uh-oh. So Eisenberg goes, what do we do? Katzenberg said, well, uh, we can fire him. Or we could make his life miserable. Or we could go along and see what happens. And Eisner said, what do you want to do? And Katzenberg said, well, let's go along, see what happens. And, you know, that was the okay. moment. <laughs> Joe's career was on the line. I don't think he ever knew it. But, but uh, and, you know, he did a great job. So <laughs> that's amazing. That's amazing. Yeah. So, um, do, by the way, do you outline when you work? Extensively. I mean, I outline, I, I take notes for months or however long I have. And then, you know, to the point where I'll have 150 pages of just notes. Sometimes I've written the same scene twice and don't even remember it. But and then I go through and I organize them. I, I make sure there's space between them. I print them out. I slice every idea in paragraph or whatever or scene into a separate thing. I put them in a pile. I pick it up and I go, oh, this is act two somewhere. And I, I leave the floor open. So I lay the whole thing out uh, along the floor. And they're at the point that I start, there's there are places where I, I don't know how I'm going to connect scenes. I might not even know how this whole section is going to work. But while I'm figuring out what's going on with all the other stuff, those little aha connection moments happen, you know, so it's a it's a really good process. And I just stumbled on it. Do you do you when you're writing, are you trying to tap into the ether? Are you trying to do that thing that that kind of flows through you or not because no you're just what no i'm just into the story completely into the story and characters you know they're they're the ones driving it so you're not trying to like waiting for inspiration or the muse to show up no no they are the muse and, and it'll show up if you work with them you know if you're just there the ether to me is a kind of place of self-criticism of thinking, Oh my God, nobody's ever going to make this. Okay. You, That's you, how, you just, how. I just, you just read that somebody just sold a horror film for a script for $15 million. Anybody going to buy this piece of crap? I'm, you know, this, this thing I'm working on, no chance that all those things come in, you got to leave them out. You know, that's the, so just stay with your story, you know, get through the first draft. Maybe at the end, you'll just go, Oh, this was a bad idea. You've wasted a couple of months, whatever, but probably not. Something comes out of it. You're a better yeah, writer. Something. You're a better writer. So you're better, absolutely. You know. Now, how um, do you deal? How do you deal with studio notes? Um, I I kind of figure that the people giving the notes have the same pride of authorship that that I have. So you know, their job to give notes, right? So I want to encourage them to give good notes, and I do the same thing to them that they do to me, which is they if they're good, they'll always start by going, "Wow, we love what you did." Da 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 da. da. Of course they're going to shred it and eviscerate it. But by telling me how much they love it and giving me all that support, I'm open. And I do the same thing to them when they're giving me the notes. I go, oh, that's interesting. Really good. huh? I write everyone down as if I love it. And they feel very good about my response. And then when I come back and go, yeah, you know, I love this note. I love that one. But this thing, you know, I'd like to do it, but it doesn't work because of this. They listen because they know I'm on their side. If I'm defensive in the room, you know, which I did when I was early going, they're just like, "Uh oh, we got a defensive writer and they're not going to listen to anything you say. But if you're if you're open there, you just you form a great relationship and then they go, yeah, you know, you're right. That that would ruin the whole rest of the movie if you did that. So, so you, know, you don't so. you don't drop because I've heard some writers do this is that they'll put something in so ridiculous just to give them some some meat. You don't do that. No, I never do anything that I think would would be anything because it possibly that. might get stuck in there if you if you're not too careful. <laughs> Absolutely, you know, don't don't ever write anything you don't want shot, you know. And did you ever yeah. did you ever hear the story of what um uh, Goodwill Hunting uh, what uh, they did with the script? No. Mm-hmm. In the middle of the script, they put this massive orgy sex scene with <laughs> Will Hunting and ah. his friends, and there's this giant thing. And I forgot who it was. I think it was either Chris Moore or I think Chris Moore told us, told me this story on the show. And it's like, he gave it to the studio, which was, I think that was Touchstone as well. It was a Touchstone or Hollywood, one of those uh, Disney arms, if I'm yeah, not mistaken. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, or Miramax, it was a Miramax film at the time. Yeah, that's um, right. And then I think it was somebody who read it and they're like, you know, we love the movie, but that 
that orgy scene in the middle, this it seems a little out of place. And they go, we want to make sure that you read the entire thing. So we stuck that entire scene in that's there. Funny. And that's yeah. how we know if you actually read it or if you didn't read it. Because if you read it, you're going to say something. <laughs> that's great. That's so smart. Yeah, yeah. The interesting thing to me is most people, and I'm, I'm guilty of this myself, when they hit something that really bumps them and bumps them badly, they don't read anything after that, really. They just, they think they have, they will finish the script, but you know, you get in a meeting and you, you know, some... they'll go, oh boy, that thing, you know, they'll start and you can tell something's really wrong. That thing on page 20, uh, what did you do? Da, da, da. You fix that and you come back and they go, and God, all that stuff you fixed in the second half of the script. It's amazing. Where did you get, how did you do that in just a, a day? And you know, it's been there all along. They just couldn't, they couldn't right. process it. Yeah. So it's it's interesting that way. Uh, sometimes sometimes uh, I've heard uh, even I've done this on a couple of jobs where I'll just write the same. I'll I'll just I'll just send it to them again after the note, uh, yeah. and they'll go, "Oh, it's so much better this time." I'm that's like, great. "I think that's great." I'm grabbed. Your your notes are fantastic. <laughs> <laughs> now, is there is there anything you wish somebody would have told you at the beginning of your career? Mm. Wow. A little bit of a little nugget of something you're like, man, you know, when you win the Oscar, <laughs> well, yeah. no, besides uh, that, besides that. <laughs> people told me so many things. I got a lot of good advice. You know, most of the advice was if you can do anything else with your life, get out, you know, because yeah. you no know, matter how talented you are, this movie's going to eat, this film is going to eat you alive. And, um, and people told me that, you know, but I was too stubborn and, you know, to listen, that's not going to happen to me, you know. <laughs> Never me. <laughs> it no, happened to everybody other... else, you know, that guy. ever ever picked up a pencil. But, um, you know, I, I don't know. Uh, I mean, I, people have told me, you know, just only fight the, the important fights. Don't, you know, and I don't agree with that. I, I actually think you do better. You know, I mean, I've had people say, why why don't, you know, come on, can't we just do that? And it's like, no. Why would I agree to, to do something? Why would you want to do something that's that's not right for the movie? Every little detail. We have no idea what's going to bump this audience and throw them out. So let's not let's not make any mistakes if we can help it. You know, we're going to make plenty, but let's not consciously do something that we think is just OK. You know, um, no, I got I, I, I think I think I can't think of anything. I mean, maybe I'm just. Yeah. Okay. Fair yeah. enough. Fair enough. Now, tell me about your new film, Double Down South, which you wrote and directed. I was yeah. telling you, I saw the trailer, and it's so refreshing to see. With the trailer is great. It's well put together, shot mm -hmm. gorgeously. But I'm really intrigued by the story because I've never seen a film about Kino, right. uh, and in the South, which is like this unique. You normally it's in a big city like Color of Money or mm -hmm. something like that, hustling bars. But tell me about that film. Um, I grew up, as I told you, in Nashville and, uh, you know, as part of a misspent youth would go to this pool hall called 20th Century Pool Hall, which was a dive in, in a, a fairly shabby, then shabby part of Nashville. And um, th three guys named Nick ran it. They were uh, Nick, 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 old Nick, middle Nick and young Nick. Young Nick in that play was about 30, I guess. Old Nick was this just crotchety old guy. Middle Nick was a genuinely mean person, you know, and you just, you'd never want to, you ask him one question, you never talk to him again. He was so dismissive. And I was, a, you know, he hated kids there, but he let us come in because, you know, we spent money on, on, and in the corner, they had this game called Kino Pool, which was this board you put on the table. There are holes in the board, there are numbers for the balls, and there's this double hole and if you make a double, you get to shoot again and you, the bet doubles. So if you and I are playing for five bucks and we both put five dollars on the table and I make a double on the break, you have you are now owe me 10 bucks and I get to shoot again. And the bet's now 10 bucks. And if I hit the double hole again on the break, you owe me 20 bucks. So people that are good at doubling up and, you know, the first time I played, I made the mistake of not quite understanding that and you know almost lost my watch because and never got to shoot because if you shoot and miss it's the other guy's shot and he gets to keep going until he misses so it's it's a diabolical gambling game and there was this really good-looking woman 
I have no idea how old she is, but I mean, I was 14. She would come into this place every now and then and would be back there with the guys playing Kino. And, uh, you know, we'd sit back there, uh, my friends and I just gawking at her and she never gave, you know, even glanced at us, but it stuck with me because it was a rough crowd and she seemed to, she was, I never saw her smile. She was a tough, tough hombre, you know? And um, so she was kind of the, for years, I thought I want to make something, a story. I want to write a story about this, but it never just kind of went away. I couldn't figure it out. And then maybe, I don't know, a year, a little over a year ago, I just went, oh my God, I know what that is supposed supposed to be. Because I had a friend whose brother ran a poker game in a county near outside of Nashville. And it was kind of a, he was really smart about it because he, I mean, it was illegal, but he paid off the cops and he would bring star poker players from all over the United States in, advertise them, you know, kind of uh, uh, underground and poker players from all over would show up to see if they could beat these guys, you know, and he took a cut of the pot. That's all he did. Just cut the pot. Smart. And, yeah. So that, that, those two things were sort of the inspiration for this plantation house. Where where this game of Kino is played is a kind of you know high stakes Kino. I, I mean, I'm dying to see it. I can't wait to see it. It looks it look like I said it looked really cool. It's like it's an original idea. I just haven't seen that before, and that's such a rarity mm-hmm. in today's mm-hmm. world that you just because everything has been made, everything is every story has been yeah. done, but yeah. but this is just a unique placement for it. So mm-hmm. I so this is uh, I think this is an independent film at this point, it right? Is. It is. Yeah, yeah. So how'd you get? Uh, how'd you get the cash? How'd you, how'd you get this thing off the ground? Because it's not easy nowadays. <laughs> My friend Rick Wallace, who is we've been friends since the late seventies, um, television director, was worked for Botchko for years, ran some of Botchko shows. Great guy, just dear old friend. Read read the script, and he's he's moved uh, to near outside of Seattle. And he said, you know, there's a whole group of people up here that every now I meet them, and now again they say. If you've got any any you know movie ideas or whatever, you know we've invested in some low budget horror films, blah blah blah. And I said, sure, give them the script. And you know what? It just they just came through. It couldn't have been any easier. You know the budget's very low, so sure. you know and uh, and they were just like the day the money was supposed to be there, it was there. What? And, what? Yeah, I know. I know. I mean, you mean the money me, dropped I, on the day it was supposed on to the drop? Day. Everything was just, you know, as easy as as could be that way, you know, and we still had to go off in the middle of COVID and, and you know, make the movie in 22 days. But but, you know, we did everyone. It. Everyone listening. This is not the way things happen. It, never, it, never. The money you know, never is there. Ever. Never. <laughs> never comes. <laughs> yeah. It's always like, oh, tomorrow. But yeah. we have to pay people. Well, we'll just start shooting now, and we'll pay you. On, we'll get it to you on Friday. Right. I'm like, that's so right. that that it's just that unless you're studio based, it's that's just the way it goes. At the that's end right. Of the yeah, yeah. So it's it's a shock, and you know, I just hope they get their money back. So, uh, and but it looks it looks great. I can't. I really am looking forward to see. It. And it comes out in May. You said yes. It's going to be released in a minimum of ten cities. In, in theaters in May. And then right after that, it'll be on all the digital platforms. And then after that, uh, you know, it's streaming somewhere. It'll, it'll find a home somewhere. Yeah. A final, final resting place. So, so let me ask you, uh, you know, as directors, there's always that one day on set that is that you feel the entire world's coming crashing down around you. Uh, I mean, and it's generally every day, but yeah. there's, yeah. Uh, <laughs> but there's that yeah. one day, unless you're Peter Weir and then you're just, a cool cucumber, but, right. um, but for the rest of us mortals, yeah. uh, what was that day for you either on this project or, or, or any of the other projects you've worked on and how did you overcome it? Well, th- th- that day for me was, uh, probably about 15 days into the shoot, maybe a little less, maybe 12 to halfway through we were, I was shooting a scene. That's about two. It's basically the end of act two. And, you know, it had been there and seemed good for, you know, the however many months it had been, eight months since I'd written it, and hundreds of eyes had seen it, I shot the scene, it felt good, woke up at two o'clock in the morning and went, oh my God, that scene, the movie does not work from that point on. 
it's this, I've made a huge mistake. And the, the character that's talking about this would not be concerned about what he's talking about. Oh. The whole movie falls apart at this point. And I just, it's like, oh my God. And I, you know, I just thought, I, 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 I can't say this. It's done. I'm going to have to go in and I'm going to call the investor. I mean, we're, we're screwed. So, um, and then I thought, okay, you're a writer. Just put on the tea and see what, ha- you know, think this through. And by five in the morning, because I had to be on the set, at, I had to leave at 5.30 for the set. I had figured out the whole, how to rewrite the scene. And the movie, not only was it was going to work better because of the new, what, the way the scene was going to be. And I went to the set and I said, we got to reshoot that scene from yesterday. No, we don't have time. Why would you do it? It was a great scene. We all love it. I said, listen to me. And I told them what was wrong with the scene. They're like, oh my God, you're right. And here's how we fix it. Oh my God. Okay, great, great. We'll we'll figure out how to reschedule it. And we did. So it was, but that was a terrifying day. <laughs> oh my God. You know, it was. Mm. It is. There's always that day. I mean, it's, you know, film, we're, we're insane. This is an insane proposition. It really uh, is. It's art at, at a level because you could be an artist, be a writer, and just write, and that's fine. There's there's stakes, but they're not that big in the mm-hmm. sense that like it's you and your time. You could be a painter, you could be a musician. They're very solitary. But when you're working as as a director, yeah, and you've got millions of dollars and people's careers, and every yeah. second that is going by, all you hear is cha ching, cha ching. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's it's just it is so crazy to be spending money at the rate we spend it normally at the, in the way we do, you know, it's just, it's always baffling to me. I mean, I rehearsed, we, we rehearsed before this movie. We had a couple of readings before dead poets. Most people never rehearse. And then it's like, what? You don't ever even have a read through the script. I mean, come on, you gotta, you gotta at least, I mean, every one of those, those exercises gives you a, a big clear picture or a clearer picture of what's working and what's not. And yet people just, and by the way, most stuff works. It's not like it's, you it's know, insane. <laughs> yeah. So, but, but, you know, to me, the process is, it, it's baffling, you know, but that's the way we do it. So that's what we did. Now I'm going to ask you a few questions to ask all my guests. Uh, what advice would you give a screenwriter or filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Well, today it's easier in a way because you can go out with your cell phone and your friends and you can make something, you know, you can write it, you can direct it and shoot it and, you know, you you can, and it won't cost much. So I, that's what I would do. That's what I would advise anybody to do. And if you don't want to direct, you know, find somebody who, who likes your script and, you know, somebody your age, preferably with the, who will listen and, you know, and, and make your stuff. Cause there's huge opportunity out there now, you know, you can get your stuff. I mean, agents won't read anything anymore. It's yes, hard it. to get them to watch you. If you're going to make something, even if you make a short, you, you need to make the trailer for the short. <laughs> They'll watch a 30 second trailer. They will not watch your eight minute short, you know? So amazing. Make, isn't it? Isn't, isn't it? I know. I know. So, um, you know, we, we made the trailer, the part of the deal was you're going to make a trailer for the movie just to sell it, you know, cause the sales agents do not want to watch your movie. They, they'll watch the, if, if you tease them with the trailer and they like the trailer, then they'll watch the movie, call them up and say, you've got a movie. They'll go, okay, we'll see it. And, you know, two months later, it's like, yeah, yeah, we'll get to it. Show them the good trailer. They'll watch it that night, the movie that night. I mean, you just. You you know, short attention spans are something we just all have to deal with now. So, you know, make sure you 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 cater to that. Now, what is the lesson that took you the longest to learn, whether in the film business or in life? Mm. You know, trust trust my instincts. Um I did it when writing, you know, when I'm sitting down, I'm alone and I just you know, I just try whatever. I don't spend a lot of time, you know, questioning my own instincts. I just, if I think this is a bad scene, it is. And I just redo it. Or if I feel like something's wrong, I fix it. You know, I don't, I don't ask myself, should I fix this? I just do it. But when I get with people as a director and, you know, and in meetings, I'm, I'm less likely to sort of just lay out who I am. And that's a mistake. You know, you got to get comfortable just 
sometimes being the dumbest person in the room or, or the, you know, the, like, or like Tom Hanks and big going, I don't get it. You know, and even if everybody's going, what do you mean? You don't get it. Come on. You did it. You know, you're going, you know, you just gotta, you got to be completely honest with, with people. And, uh, and if you are it, it, you know, I got after two or three movies getting made and I, I just somehow I got more, um, or let's say less likely to to be uh, to rock the boat a little bit, you know, just in some ways less less confrontational than I had been before. You know, Disney when I started there had a reputation of being a writer killing studio. You know, the writers would just complain, "Oh my God, I, you know, I was I wrote for a month and you know summarily fired and blah blah blah." And I I didn't really know that. So I just spoke up whenever I thought some. I mean, I just was just like, I don't think that works. And then the people would look and you'd talk and then, okay, all right, well, what do you got? What would work? Well, you know, that we, we had a real dialogue all the time. Uh, I was less likely to do that at other places. And I frankly don't know why, but it was a mistake because you just, you have to fight the fight. Maybe, maybe I was aware that the other places had, had shorter fuses, you know, and, uh, uh, and I had come to trust that Katzenberg wasn't going to fire me no matter how obnoxious. And we had some shouting matches, big ones, and uh, in front of other people, you know, but, and I, you know, just, we just trigger each other like that. And he never, you know, most of the time he would cave. If you fight hard enough, he will cave, you know, or that's, at least he, he would back then. But I don't know, I got, I, I pulled back from that and I don't think it helped the movies that I had made later. Fair enough. Fair enough. Yeah. And that's the opposite of most people will tell you, you know, try to try to please. But I, I don't think that's the answer. What are three screenplays that every screenwriter should read? Uh, well, for sure, Casablanca, for sure, Chinatown. Uh, and I, I think Groundhog Day, you know, it's one of the it's one of the most brilliant scripts ever written. Yeah. Yeah, and I and I've I've said it so many times. It's the most spiritual film I've ever seen. It's amazing. Yeah, it is. Yeah. It's the, literally the most. It's this. It's the journey of a soul, it reincarnating really again and again until he gets it right, and he exactly. learns his lessons along the way. And at the end, he is liberated. I mean, it's literally that. Yeah, it's it's one of my favorite movies of all time. You know, oh, it's, and it's, it's incredible. So yeah. And then, what are three films? Uh, three of your favorite films of all time. Three of my favorite films. Well, oh God, that's so hard. Um, today, today, today. If I had, you know, I, I guess the two Godfathers. That counts uh, as one. That counts as one. Okay, that counts as one. Um, probably Ikaru. You ever seen that? Oh, Ikaru, of course, of course. I yeah. oh, I yeah, love that not. film. Yeah, yeah. Oh, and, um, uh, um. I guess Casablanca. I, I would have to say it's beautiful. You know, the message of that movie is just it's one of the most you know it's it's humanity's best moment, you know, I think that that what happens in that movie. So, you know. Tom, it has been a pleasure talking to you, my friend. Thank you so much uh, oh, again. Yeah. Th thank you so much again for all those amazing filmmaking moments you gave me. Uh coming up and and i'm dying to see your latest movie when it comes out but uh, i appreciate you my friend thank you again for all the uh the knowledge and the and the wonderful stories i appreciate you it's a real pleasure <laughs>